Hello, everybody. I'm Julie Lytle, the Director of Distributed and Lifelong Learning at Bexley Seabury Seminary, and the guide for tonight's conversation. Jen Grinnell and Connie Campbell Pearson are happy to have you join me in this special edition of Deacons Talking on the Road to Emmaus, which tonight is going to feature our responses and reflections on the current pandemic. As you probably know, Deacons Talking on the Road to Emmaus is a web-based series of programs designed as a way to have deacons walk together and share stories in the hope of animating and supporting and renewing diaconal ministries across the country. It's inspired by the story of Cleopas and other disciples who, after recounting all that they had experienced while walking on the road to Emmaus with a stranger, recognized that it was Jesus in their midst. Having Jesus' presence really resurrected their ability to release their fear and grief and return to Jerusalem to share the good news of the resurrected Christ. And we hope that these programs offer you that same kind of inspiration in the midst of fear and grief to be able to remember the resurrected Christ who we will be celebrating this week. Tonight's program, as always, is sponsored by the Association for Episcopal Deacons, along with the Episcopal Province of New England and Bexley Seabury's Lifelong Learning. It's typically offered on the third Thursday of the month, which we've added these special editions and we are probably going to be shifting. But for both April and May, there will be two more third Thursday conversations that you'll be getting invitations to make your reservation for. The next one is going to be on April 16th. It will be at 7 p.m. Eastern Time when Deacon Janet Tidwell will talk about anti-racism. Yesterday, beloved community, and today, a new approach for dismantling racism. All of these conversations are recorded and are posted on the Province One website, so you can always go to province1.org to find them under the Deacons tab. And after Jan opens us with prayer, we'll move through the rest of the evening. So Jan, please take it away. Thank you, Joy. Um, what you're seeing right now is my screen for those of you who are not familiar with Zoom. And The prayer that I am um, offering tonight was um, adapted from a prayer written by Bishop Thomas Brown of Maine. So let us pray. Jesus Christ, you traveled through towns and villages curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to our aid now in the midst of the global spread of the coronavirus. Heal those who are sick with the virus. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Be present with those in authority who are making hard decisions. Support the medical professionals, emergency responders, and our caregivers. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So the format that we've been using is um, one that we had talked about early on. Um, and what I, before we go into the format, just to let you know that I will be taking notes tonight and Julie will be distributing those notes after to all participants. And, and actually, I guess all people who registered, right, Julie? Even those who aren't present with us tonight. If you have any um, information that you would like to share with others, you can send it to either myself or um, Connie Campbell, who's going to be the facilitator in a few minutes when we get started here. And at the end of this uh, time together, which will be about an hour, we will take time to talk about whether or not it's um, worth our time and effort to do this again in another couple of weeks. So we will talk about that when we finish knowing that this doesn't have to have a life forever, we hope, but we are willing to do this as long as it's helpful to people. And tonight's format's going to be somewhat different. We're going to talk about 
um, things that deacons have been working on across the country with their ministries and things we've been engaged with. And um, following that, we're gonna take some time just to check in with people to see how each of us are doing with um, our own personal um, involvement with the whole pandemic, whether we need support or just time to share with one another, we wanna leave time for that to happen as well. So we're gonna use open space technology as we did before. That means that uh, there's nothing that we're expecting to happen tonight and whatever does happen is, um, is what sh should happen. The right people are here. And um, we will start in a few seconds here. And when it's over, it's going to be over. The one thing that we do note is that the law is if you find that it's not right for you, it's okay to leave the meeting. And you do that by going down to the corner of your screen and click on the meeting. It's very simple to do. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Connie, who then is going to introduce um, one of my deacons from Rhode Island here. Connie? Welcome, everybody. And I think the first uh, person that we want to hear from is Barbara from Rhode Island. Hello. All right, I, am I on? Yes. No. Okay. Um, my name is Barbara Maystock. I am a, a retired deacon from the Diocese of Rhode Island. And Archdeacon Grinnell has asked me to share with you information about making face coverings or masks to help people keep safe during this pandemic. In the beginning, the doctors didn't feel that it was necessary to have all the people cover their faces for protection against infection spread. But recently, that directive has changed because the doctors are recognizing that as part of social distancing, it is one more tool in the effort to stem the spread of illness in the community. If a person is asymptomatic and has the virus, it can be transmitted without anyone knowing because there's no fever, no coughing or anything like that. So my mask protects you from me and your mask protects me from you. So we should all be wearing them. I wanna be very clear in saying that a cloth mask is not the same as a medical mask, but the average person does not need medical type mask coverage. Safety precautions when going to the store the food bank, the pharmacy, the laundromat, once a week is helped by the additional use of a cloth face covering. Be sure that you let people know who are using them that they must be laundered every time that they are used. I don't know, but I would love to have input on how this question can be dealt with in shelters or for those who don't have ready access to washing machines on a regular basis. So maybe somebody's got some idea about that. I've been making cloth masks for a while and I want to share how you can also engage in doing this or possibly share this information with others who can sew and have the required materials. After doing my research online, I found a mask that I really like because it has two layers of protection, cotton fabric and non-woven interfacing, and an inserted piece of soft aluminum, which molds to close the mask around the top of the nose for added protection. The details can be shared at another time for those of you who are interested or have specific questions, or if you'd like a tutorial as was mentioned earlier. For now, if you are interested, there is a very good video which you can find on YouTube by searching in the search engine for the fabric patch face mask. That's the fabric patch face mask. The woman who does the video is a retired nurse who now works at this quilting shop showing how to construct the mask. And the pattern is also available on that video. As I mentioned before, 
If there is interest, I'd be happy to answer general questions or help if there are questions about the video. So let the moderators know and they can always get back to me. I'd be happy to take any of your questions and I thank you for your time and attention and just want to say God bless you in all your work. Thank you, Barbara. Can you tell me, is there a, is it a one size fits all? The pattern that I have actually has four different sizes. It has men, ladies, uh, ladies slash teenager, and uh, child, and there are two different sizes for that. And typically, I don't know if you can see this because I have Jan's um, PowerPoint up, but can you see this if I hold this up? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is a mask that I make. You can see it sort of has a, a shape to it around your nose. And when you put it on, this is my mask, so I'm going to put it on. And it has two elastics that come out of either side. When you put it on, you put it around your ears and you mold that little piece of aluminum foil. Well, not foil, but aluminum. And you see how that fits? And it ends up, I'm going to take that off because it's hard to hear when you're wearing it. Um, it ends up giving you the opportunity to breathe through the mask and not have a lot of air come in. I like this because it's a more molded one than the one that um, they show a lot that has the pleats and the open, the sides are always pretty open. Um, so I like this one. And um, just as an aside, I made this one for Archdeacon Grinnell. <laughs> what is it? What, what, what? Are you, I, can you see it? Oh, Patriots. <laughs> it's Patriots, yeah. So I, you know, it takes about, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes once you get going to make a mask. What I do, because I'm making lots of them, is um, take a page from back in the old days when I had a small in-house business where I did a lot of embroidery and a lot of sewing. And in order to save time, it's almost like an assembly line where you do all the washing of fabric, ironing of fabric, then you lay out and you cut everything, then you sew one step at a time all the way through. And then at the end you're done and you've got you know 60 or 70 masks when you're finished. And then you just start the whole process over again. And can I just ask Barb, how is it that you're trying to distribute them? Well, it's a very interesting thing. When I first started doing them, my thought was to go to um, uh, first re responders. And so I did try to do that, but they actually need more of the medical type masks, the firemen, uh, the, um, the police officers need more of a medical mask if they can get it. If they can't, they're happy to have them. And what I do is I would call the police department, call the city hall. But what I decided to do is now that they're asking people to all wear them, I thought, you know, we're trying to get people not to buy the N95s if they find them and leave them for the medical people. So I'm really trying to put these in everyday hands. So one of the things that I, I had a little brainstorm the other day and I called the parish priest, I haven't heard back yet. I think, you know, she's probably doing a bunch of stuff this week uh, with all of the online uh, services that she's planning. But what I wanna do is I wanna ask her if she has some ideas how we reach out to, especially the elderly in the parish. And also, you would be surprised, once people know you're making masks, they have a way of finding you. And so I get calls from people saying, could you make six or eight for me? I have you know, two kids and my husband and I, or you know, whatever the case might be. So, um, and also, here's the other thing is I was watching um, Governor um, uh, Gina the other day, and I was thinking um, I, could, I could probably call her helpline for COVID-19 and see if they have an idea for, for
for disseminating them. Can I ask Laurie? a couple sure, questions? Sure, Laurie, go ahead. I can't remember how to raise my hand on here. I know I used to know. A um, <laughs> couple things. You said it has a little uh, piece of uh, aluminum in it. What is that? Where do you source that aluminum? What's that from? Well, this is the ingenious thing I would have never thought of in a million years, but the lady who does the video uh -huh. has said that what you do is, you, you know the aluminum plate pans that you get at the market when you're putting a lasagna and taking it to somebody's house? Yeah. You buy those and uh -huh. you cut the bottom out, only okay. the bottom. I and see. You get rid of the sides. And then, and it says this in, in the um, pattern, you cut a grid of, I believe it's one inch by two inches or two and a half inches. And you cut them all out and then you fold them in thirds and then you fold in the ends. So okay, that's great. Up, it's gonna hurt. And did they, um, the only thing I see about the, um, they also, don't they put interfacing in the middle of them? Yes, this is why I like this particular one because the way this is made is you have two layers of high grade cotton, which is quite porous um, and which allows you to breathe well. But inside here, there are two layers of um, lightweight fusible interfacing. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. I heard also that they prefer it if the white is on the inside so you can tell. But um... But other than that, I've been making some and I have been quite concerned about how poorly they fit. So the idea of having a pinchy nose thing is very appealing to me. Yes, in fact, several people who took them and put them on called me and said, it seems like it's awfully big. And I, my first go-to question is, did you pinch the nose? Yeah. And yeah. almost none of them had and had a perfect fit once they did Right, that. right, it does help a lot. Yeah. So I and just want to remind everyone. Fogging up. Just remind everybody that if you do have more questions, please use the chat box if you want to ask Barbara more. Thank you, Barbara. That was wonderful. Oh, you're very welcome. Do we have any other ideas that people are coming into? I'll just share one, and that was something that our community started um, we, we have people who are artists, and I'm sure your community does too, that uh, we are soliciting them to uh, go do some live streaming. And um, the first one was last night, and I, I will say um, I was able and privileged to be able to do the first concert. Uh, and, but it doesn't have to be you, the deacon. I just happen to be... Uh, an organist and a covenist, but uh, all the proceeds from that, because people wanted to hear good music there at home. Um, and mm. I actually played a whole repertoire of Holy Week, just moving through Holy Week of what you would hear. If you could have been in your church today, this is what you would have heard, uh, um, you know, us uh, singing. And then if you went to Thursday night, this is what you would hear and Friday, the Good Friday service. And um, just ended with uh, this little my light of mine, because I think we need to take that light out and let it shine. But uh, it, it was really fun. Um, but I think it's a good way to give people some, some gift, some talent, and then they will tip you and, and give to whatever organization you want it to be given to. And in this case, I chose the homeless uh, people in Bozeman. So just an idea, you might have some gifted and talented people that would be willing to uh, live stream and uh, do a regular uh, program like that. Tommy, I have a question. Sure. How do, you, how do the people make that contribution? If I wanted to, when I was, if I had been listening to you last night and I wanted to make a contribution to the homeless people in Bozeman. Oh, uh, well, so let me just, I'll just put up the link to where it went and then you can see how it worked. They have a tip jar. They just send the tips to that. So um, I'll just put the link up. Okay. Thank you. Then you can listen to my little concert, Jan. I will do that. <laughs>
Love listening to you. Anybody else? Other ideas that people have for how they're helping their congregation? Are you still calling your congregants and um, I'm looking down the list here to see who might have their hand up. I have a question for people, Connie, while we're waiting for people to sure. get inspired. Bonnie and Robin also. Oh, Bonnie and Robin? Okay. Oh, take them. Bonnie, why don't you go ahead then? Oh, I see. Bonnie, go ahead. You can unmute yourself, Bonnie. No. Oh, there it goes, finally. Um, I just want to say that I listened to a concert in Long Island, in, in um, Huntington, Long Island, yesterday and last Sunday, and it was put on by the um, choir director. Um, he plays uh, baby grand piano and in the hour that he played last Sunday they got contributions greater than three thousand dollars that went to their rapid response for meals for people and also for our housing needs so it 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 was quite easy to go on and and donate so that is a good thing one of the things that I just did um, tonight, I, um, I continue to make phone calls to um, the congregants of the cathedral in Hartford, but something else I did, um, the ENS news came out this uh, today, and um, I signed up for dial a priest, um, where hospitals, um, it, it, it um, it's a service and the hospitals will be able to dial up a number for um, administration last right. And um, you will be on call and they will ping you in on your phone and you can be with family or with um, someone who is in the process of dying. Oh my. So, you, the name of that again, you, Bonnie, for the notes. Yeah, put that link up for us. It's the Episcopal <coughs> News Service. Um, and it was, it's, it's in the news that just came out. Dial a priest. Oh, dial a priest. Yep. Oh. And it's priests and deacons. They're looking for priests and deacons in the Episcopal Church. Oh. I can get it for you. Are we putting the link in the chat room? And when you go online, you can put down the hours that you would be willing to be on call. They're offering the services, I think, from 7 in the morning till midnight. Um, and they're, they've gotten some calls already, but they're expecting that there will be more calls that will have to happen. Hmm. And Bonnie, you said that that's for both um, patients as well as family members? Yes. And what's happening is nurses are, are, are um, calling up the dial a priest number and they're getting patched through so that you can um, have prayers with, with the person who is dying or with the person's family. Wow. And you can offer administration at the time of death. Hmm.
Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie. That's really great. Mm. So, Bonnie, does that mean that um, I could be talking to somebody in California, even? If yes. Not just Rhode Island, just yep. anywhere. This is across the country, and priests and deacons across the country responding. Yes. Awesome. Yep. Right now, they have um, 87 priests and deacons volunteering, but expect to need more. Hmm. Now I can't lower my hand. Oh. oh, how about Robin? Are you ready to go, Robin? Would you like to say something? Yes, actually, I have a, um, a question for folks, and that is, um, in what way are you able to address those who do not have internet nor smartphones in being able to provide um, access to the services? Um, one, one thought that we had a, a clergy conference today with um, Valley Interfaith Project, our social justice organization here in the Phoenix area. And one of the, the Methodist groups was having people dial into Zoom. Um, but that number, unless you're paying the license with the um, toll free number, that's a toll number. And I'm not sure that they have the international calling on their phones that supposedly went into effect, but I don't know. So um, I'm just curious, because that certainly is one way, but that doesn't help for Facebook Live. It doesn't or, help for what did you say? There's a lot of feedback on the line here. Um, it doesn't help for a feedback live or a YouTube live that's, that's being done. Um, it only helps if it's a Zoom uh, session that they can get into. So I'm just, I'm just trying to find out how we can address it. We're calling and talking to people, but it's not the same. Mm. We don't have too many in our congregation that have resisted email and internet and smartphones, but the few that we do have, that's one reason we switched to a Zoom uh, service. It does also live stream to Facebook or YouTube, but um, the Zoom service allows them to call in. And if you break out into breakout rooms, um, those people that called in on their phones were highly appreciative of it because they're not getting the email or anything. They don't have internet, but to just be able to talk to people in the breakout rooms was a real blessing to them. Right. And, and, and I would see that my concern is, is that if it's a toll number, they may not realize that's a toll number until they get their phone bill. Right. So that, that's a concern I have. I'm trying to ascertain if, um, if that's still really true or how they would know if they have, um, it, you know, nat nationwide calling. Um, but they may not if they don't even n know how to access it. So um, certainly I know going on Zoom, but one of the things we're doing is we're in the process of creating individual videos that we are then um, video editing together and then you upload those as a premiere that's the function facebook live premiere at the time that we say we're going to be live and then the, all the chat and everything is all live but what they're actually seeing is a video that's playing um and then th that can go to youtube or you can do youtube live so because we're doing that we're not we're not doing our church service over zoom um, individuals are doing different Zooms that we record, and then I have a, a parishioner who's um, compiling all of this into one video straight. Mm. That, Connie, I see your I see your note, but they're not the toll free is only if you're paying for that. That is an actual feature that you have to pay for. Because I have a I have a pro license and it's not covered. I have to go to either a business or an enterprise license to get the toll free. Oh, thank so you. I didn't understand that. Or I have to or I have to buy it as an add-on feature, which is like a couple hundred dollars a year to have. Wow. So um, yeah, that that's where it starts to get expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it, it's definitely something to look into. And, and if a diocese at a diocesan level is doing that, that might, might make sense, but 
that's my only concern. And, and I, I don't want to lose those parishioners. We are touching base weekly with people. I like the idea of breaking into even smaller groups and having people check each other. Um, I've got a team of about 10 right now. Um, and then we're, we're calling different folks and touching base. And obviously that's appreciated. And it's going to be something we need to think about as we come out of this pandemic. Um, because in a way, we're, we're increasing the touch for a, lo a lot of people. And, and what, how we manage those expectations beyond this, I think is something to start kind of thinking about and how, what strategies that might look like. Thank you, Robin. Any other thoughts that people have or things that you're doing? You're trying, you're failing at. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm one of the people that's just on audio. Okay. Hi. I'm Anne. Hi, I'm Anne from the Diocese of Maine. And um, one of the things that unfortunately has happened is there has been a great increase in uh, domestic violence. So what we're trying to do is get people to do the, do the online training so that they can be hotline listeners and refer people to safe places and help them to to develop a plan should something happen. By online training, do you mean the safeguarding God's people, that online training specifically? No, it's it, no no, it it's real it's um by in by the groups, the different shelters that are available in the state. There, there are a group of people to provide shelter, and they have their own lines. And so it's, uh, depending on where you are, you connect with that, and then they have it on, they have the training online. They have, they have to uh, also be um, the interviewed and all that sort of thing, make sure, you know, <laughs> you're okay. And then... Um, and then you can do the training online so that you can you can help out in your geographic area. Do you have any idea if it's available outside of Maine? I don't know, actually, but I can certainly investigate it. Thank you. You're welcome. In Connecticut, um, our abuse has increased 20%. And they have just opened up hotel rooms for um, people who are abused to go to be able to um, be in self quarantine and to get away. Mm. The Boston Globe did a an article on massive increases in domestic violence since the isolation. The, um, the National Church Tech did a presentation on um, both violence as well as addiction, as well as there was a third thing that they talked about, oh, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. All those increases, there was an online seminar or webinar, webinar about three weeks ago saying that all these things are going to be increasing. And um, one of the really awesome things that has happened in the recovery community is that most of the local meetings here in Rhode Island have gone to Zoom formats. And uh, it's been extremely successful. So um, that's that's been excellent. but with the um, domestic violence and uh, mental health, it's not, it's not a simple solution like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Anne again. <laughs> NAMI does have um, available uh, different groups that you can get to by Zoom yeah. that, so for mental health. What is the acronym? NAMI. Um, N-A-M-I. A-M-I, yes. 
National Alliance on Mental Illness. That's correct. Yes. And thank you for that National Domestic Violence Hotline. I'm not sure who Mac user's first name is. What's your name? Hmm. Oh, hi, Marcia. Thank you. So I have, um, we have about 22 minutes left and I was wondering, Connie, if we could switch over to um, some of the support questions and comments. Sure. And um, one of the things that I would like to ask people, um, here in Rhode Island, we have been having clergy meetings, weekly clergy meetings. Uh, our bishop is hosting them. They're called town hall meetings for clergy where he has been disseminating information and talking about the, from the very beginning when churches were still open now to the point where obviously everything is closed and Holy Week and and I found that those particular meetings are wonderful but they're certainly um, geared towards the priests. So what is going on in the various dioceses to um, gather the deacons together or to support the deacons? Um, as Archdeacon here in Rhode Island, I have offered a Zoom meeting tomorrow night for our deacons to jump on and just be with one another, so to speak, as we are being together tonight across the country. I find Zoom um, very helpful in terms of physical distancing and social engaging, that we can still engage socially, um, even though we have physical distancing. So I'm just curious what different dioceses are doing in support of the deacons, if anything. Jan, Connecticut also has weekly meetings. Um, and deacons are meeting every two weeks for those who want to go through Zoom to have conversation. So the weekly meetings are for all clergy? Weekly is for all clergy on Wednesday, and and I have a tendency to throw the word in the word deacon in every time I have an opportunity, um, and it usually ends up that I end up with more work to do. <laughs> but um, I'm taking that opportunity, and one of the things that did come out of that was was. Um, we have six regional groups now, um, priests, deacons, and lay folk who are interested in um, ministering with the homeless and those who are suffering or lacking food security. And with the COVID-19, everything is changing so rapidly that we are meeting every two weeks um, and updating what shelter status is, what soup kitchens are open and we're sharing that within our regions or for a better word deaneries so that people have the most up-to-date information for, for um, helping. So these San Diego is are meeting how often Bonnie? Deacons? No the regional groups the regional groups are just about every two weeks, and there are six regions in Connecticut. Okay. And you're meeting via Zoom? Via Zoom. Okay. Uh, I see Bob. You've got your hand up. Do you want to say something, Bob? 
Yes, San Diego has the, the same weekly all clergy in the diocese meet with the bishop. Bi-weekly, the deacons are gathering together. However, there's a high level of Zoom exhaustion mm. now. Everybody is spending so much time on Zoom. I know I averaged last week six hours a day on various different <laughs> meetings uh, that I'm representing either the diocese or uh, my parish, St. Peter's. And it, it's convenient. You learn a lot, but boy, it's so tiring. And Bob, who, who convenes the deacons? Our uh, new archdeacon, Pam Rieger, convenes the, uh, the deacons. And I see Teresa Llewellyn with a hand up. Do you want to say something? Sure. Our, um, our bishop meets with all clergy. Um, the meeting, she help, has to hold two, but it's really the same meeting um, once a week. And then the archdeacons are convening the deacons every other Sunday afternoon. Um, and some of us, some of the deacons in the diocese uh, and some lay people are joining us for Compline on Sunday nights. We're finding that need for that time together in prayer um, on a regular basis. As a, you know, very important. So those are the things we're doing when we meet as um, deacons, we share what's going on. But I, I do have to say last time we met, um, it was just all about our grief and exhaustion and our anxiety and our fears. So that was very important. I'll say since you mentioned Compline that uh, Roxy and I have been doing fixed our prayer at noon and at 5 p.m. every day it just takes about five to ten minutes and we kind of rotate around with some New Zealand prayer book and some Celtic Iona stuff and the prayer book but uh, we're seeing all, some very unexpected results from people wanting to have that fixed hour prayer and it's quite simple and very easy to do um, and people are really responding to it. So you know that there's a, a need out there for people to simply reconnect with what makes us the prayer book people, which is fixed prayer. So. And what platform are you using? We are using Facebook Live. Facebook Live? Yeah. Oh, so they can interact with you. They just listen. They can interact if you, if we, you know, they make remarks online. If they have prayer requests, we ask them to just make a comment, and then it's something that we pray about later. Uh, Kate, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to say something? Yes, thank you. First of all, thanks for the invite. I'm delighted to be here. Second of all, Marsha Hansen, hi. <laughs> Where are you from? I am from Sebastopol, California, which is near Santa Rosa, uh, an hour and something south of Sacramento. Okay. And um, I am, all of this is very amazing and cool. And I wanted to just say that we're lucky to have archdeacons who will support us. And we are getting uh, Zoom meeting support every couple of weeks with our archdeacons and with one another. And that's really good. There is Zoom fatigue. I want to say thanks for all the info on the masks. Um, I have a friend who says it's a little bit like rolling bandages in the Civil War. She and three or four other people in our congregation have so far made a couple, more than a couple hundred masks that are not professionals, but are for uh, parishioners. And which brings me to uh, my dilemma, which is not an easily fixed dilemma. My job as a deacon, I view that the deacon's job is in great part to be a bridge between the inside, people inside the church and the people outside the church. And um, I'm in an age group and a lot of people in our congregation are in an age group where we are very, very much discouraged from going anywhere. And we have been for two and something weeks now. 
And in addition to my personal issues with I'm a hands-on deacon, I like to hop in my car and go and do whatever is needed or go and pick up six people who will do it with me. Um, I am struggling now and working through some ideas about how to keep parishioners um, involved in helping others, not just for the others. It is of critical importance that everyone get to help out. And being mm -hmm. down, being on in place order means that not only do folks who might need uh, sandwiches and socks and warmers and masks, they're not getting those things, but those people who are also God's children who very much need to serve are not having that option because it's got to change the way we do it. We have to change how we figure out how to serve. Um, just this week, I connected some people um, in our community called Sonoma Acts of Kindness with some parishioners and they are, the parishioners are making sandwiches, lunch bags, and those younger people in Sonoma Acts of Kindness are doing what's called porch pickup. So, and then driving out to encampments, homeless encampments. But I'm interested in what other people are doing to maintain that uh, bridge. So I see Kate had, oh, you are the one that set up the buddy group system. Is that yeah. what you did? Okay. Kate put a note in the chat about three to four households agreeing to check in multiple times a week with one another. Uh, thank you, Kate. Does anybody else have any uh, answers that they might be able to suggest to Kate? I have one. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. We had all of our volunteers for our homeless community center were 65 or older. And then we could not use them. And by very accident, a young woman who was returning from college called me and said, what can I do? And now all of a sudden I had 20 year olds. Uh, we now have six 20 year olds who are keeping that homeless program going. Nice. And fortunately the city of Del Mar and the local sheriff's department who are the police department for the city of Del Mar have determined that as an essential activity. So they're allowing the uh, youngsters to keep it open. Mm. Can I? I'm not sure how to raise my hand. If you open up the participant list, you'll see the raise hand and uh, go down oh. to the bottom of your screen. There you go. Oh, raise hand. <laughs> so uh, can I call on Robin first? She's had her hand sure. a long time. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Robin. I'm still finishing my dinner so she can go and then I'll oh, go. Oh, no, next is Lori. Go ahead, Lori. I'm not really, um, it's not related to anything that's been set up to now, so I'm not sure if I'd take it to a segue before the person before me gets the help they wanted. Okay. Uh, Barb, do you want to say something then? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, to Kate, I, I really um, am feeling what you're feeling about wanting to get out there. And you know, when, when I was doing AIDS work in my thirties, I lived in the hospitals. I lived in all kinds of places. And this time around, we do need to be a little more aware that we are in the at-risk population. But what you're doing, getting other people involved, that's just so much. In my case, what I did was I, I'm a sewer, I'm a quilter. I'm, you know, I'm somebody who loves to work with my hands. And then I got other people to distribute what I do. And so you're on the right track. Don't, you know, feel bad because you're doing good work. Thank you. So Connie, do you want me to go now? Sure. I'm done chewing. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to share that our bishop has been extremely inclusive. And so she is actually holding two one hour check-ins as she calls them on a Wednesday afternoon and a Thursday morning um, for all clergy. 
to get on the phone and just to talk. We do it through Zoom. Um, and it's not mandatory, but she has shared a lot of good information um, and has, has asked, you know, for our input and some of the ideas that you've talked, we talked about last time I was able to share. Um, and then uh, as deacons, we, we had been meeting in our, um, we're broken out in three geographic areas and so, or four geographic areas in Arizona, and we've been able to meet virtually as well with that. And then our, we are now having deanery meetings and they're meeting once a month. Um, and they're continuing that to support each other, which is more of the local geographic clergy, which includes uh, presbyters and deacons. So we are um, working together, we're collaborating. In fact, our parish uh, two weeks ago actually worshiped with one of the other parishes and a number, a number of those parishes are, um, that are doing live streaming are including other parishes. So we're, we're doing a lot more together, um, which has been great and getting to know clergy from from the other um, the other places in Arizona. So it's working well. Um, I do have some interesting issues with our Deacon Formation Academy. We've moved a lot of that to be as interactive as possible using Zoom. And I just spent, I just spent this afternoon trying to um, allay the fears of one of my lay leader faculty who is going to be teaching anti-racism and just absolutely felt there was no way she could do it over Zoom. By the time we were done, she, she now I think recognizes that we can make it interactive. So I would strongly encourage if Zoom is the platform that you're using um, for anything to make things as interactive as possible. So to try to get up uh, to speed on, on how you can use that and what are some of the clever ways that you can. And maybe at some point we could um, just do one of these could be um, Zoom tips and tricks and, and, and people could, could play with, you know, the breakout rooms, could play with the interactive features, could play with the online polling so that you could get the sense for how to really keep people engaged, um, not just for worship, but, but to be able to teach and to share. So we'll see. We're, we're having our first uh, Zoom uh, fellowship coffee hour at our parish uh, Easter Sunday. Um, and we're already hearing people are looking forward to that uh, with their beverage of choice. And, um, and we put together a, a PowerPoint showing previous Easter time together. The, in fact, we have the Easter Bunny making an appearance. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make some of this fun and, uh, and hopefully uh, this will work really well uh, for some of our folks. But again, I, I worry about those that can't um, see the internet and can't go to somebody else's house to to watch it so trying to think of ways to make that happen so looking for ideas thank you <laughs>